like to welcome you to this series called Fit for Purpose. And we're going to be reading from the book of Jude, which is that little book just before Revelation. Just going to read a few verses, and then we will come and make a study over these next four sessions. Jude, a sermon of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation uh, was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only Sovereign Lord and Lord. Now let's go down to verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who divide you, who follow mere natural instinct and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others, snatching them from the fire, and to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Before we study God's word together, let us just pray. Heavenly Father, we're asking you that by the Holy Spirit, you will take this written word and make it a living word in our hearts, that it will really burn within us, and bring a revelation of how we can live a victorious life in these difficult days. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here as our helper and as our teacher, and we now look to you at this time. Amen. Jude was writing to encourage and instruct the Christians on how to live and deal with attacks on Christian belief and practice, from both within and without the church. After warning them to be on their guard, he gives a fourfold instruction how to live and thrive on earth as we wait for Christ to return for his people. Nothing has changed today as we face the same challenges. Even here in the United Kingdom and in Europe, we are seeing such an attack on Christian faith. We're seeing Christian values being totally uh, sidelined. Uh, what, has been, what was abnormal 50 years ago has now become normal. We're seeing the whole thing of marriage and family being turned upside down and we're having so many things, and the tragedy is it's actually happening in our churches as well as in the world. If we want to become physically fit, that requires three elements. Diet, exercise and rest. Not just something we do occasionally, but it actually becomes our lifestyle. A lot of people do a diet for a season, but true diet is a lifestyle where you eat certain foods that will give you the the nourishment you need, but you leave, it, leave out other foods that will damage your body. And the same is true spiritually. And here, Jude gives us four things that will get us fit for purpose. You know, you're here today because God loves you, and God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And as you learn to cooperate with God and do things God's way, so you will be fit for purpose, and you will succeed. Many Christians become discouraged and defeated and give up. But Jesus has called us to, to thrive and to go forward. He doesn't look for us to be existing and hanging on till he comes, but he's given us a job to do. The great commission is that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Our job is to take the good news of Jesus out into the world where we live and make a difference. So what are these four things that Jude tells us to do? Well, he gives us four things. Number one is that we need to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Number two, he talks about praying in the Holy Spirit. Number three, he talks about keeping ourselves in the love of God. And number four, he talks about us showing mercy to other people. So over this series, what I want to do in each session, I want to take one of these sections to look at, so that we can see what God's Word has to say. So the first thing we're going to do is look at is building ourselves up in our most holy faith. Scripture has a lot to say about faith. In Hebrews 11 verse 6 it says, 
Uh, without faith, it's impossible to believe, uh, please God. Whoever comes to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. So we need faith in order to please God. But where do we get our faith from? Well, in the next chapter in Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us where that comes from. It tells us there, it gives us some good instruction. Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so you not grow weary and lose heart. So here we see that Jesus is the source of faith, and we're told to fix our eyes on him. Today people get distracted. Today people look at the situation in the world. Today people are, are caught up with technology, information, and people must have, must have, and we easily can sideline Jesus. You know, you can't get Jesus on your mobile phone apart from having your Bible there. But as we learn to fix our eyes on Jesus, and we start to consider him, something happens because he is the source of faith. Many people today, many Christians today, the tragedy is they are so full of worry and anxiety and fear. And that's because they do not know Jesus. When we know Jesus, something happens and he gives us his faith. Faith is something that comes from Jesus. He's the source of faith. So you can come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, please give me your faith to live by. And he will help you and he will give you that faith. And then we have to cause our faith to grow. And in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when I quote that verse, I like to add to it and say, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Because, you know, we don't learn much by when we hear things just once. It's as we listen to things, hear them again and again. For those of you that study for exams, you keep going over the material. You don't just hear it in your lecture or your school lesson and then you've got it and you never look at it again and you pass your exam. You keep going over it. And the more we read God's word, God's written word, be the power of the Holy Spirit becomes a living word to us and God speaks it into our heart and that's what creates faith. And also we see that as we, in Romans chapter 12, it tells us about giving ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. When we submit to God, and then we renew our mind with the word of God. We no longer think like the world. We start to think the way God wants us to think. And then we can start to see what his will is. God's will for your life is good, pleasing and perfect. Wow. How can you get better than that? God's will being good, pleasing and perfect. And he calls us to learn to think of ourselves uh, soberly and to learn to live within the measure of faith you have. You know, faith grows the more you come closer to God, the greater your faith will grow in every area of life. Faith is essential for salvation, but also it's essential for living. It's essential for overcoming the enemy. It's essential for every area of life. You have to live by faith, whether you are working in a company, whether you're teaching in a school, whether you're studying, whether you're at home with the family, wherever you are, we have to learn to live by faith. We're told to live by faith and not by sight. Don't go let what you see Rob you of your faith. Keep focused to Jesus and out of that your faith will grow. Faith is so important. And as the more we hear God speak to us, so our faith will grow. So that is good when you read your Bible. You know, reading your Bible is one of the most important things you can do. Today I, I talk to some people and they say, oh yes, I'm very busy. I don't have much time to read my Bible, but on my mobile phone I have a, an app that comes up every day. And there's one verse and one line of thought. That's wonderful. But that's not even a starter before a main course. You have to discipline yourself to read the Word of God. Uh, there's an old song that I learned in Sunday school over 60 years ago. And it's very simple. It says this, read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. And if you don't read your Bible, you don't pray every day, you're not going to grow spiritually. You're going to be pushed around. You're going to be easy meat for the enemy. But if you will get into the Word of God and start to study it and do it, something great will happen to you. And at the end of this series, we will be put on, our, on the 
on the thing. We'll put out our webpage there. And if you live in the United Kingdom or Europe, you can write to us and we will send you a copy of a book called Receiving God's Faith. Something I wrote years ago, but I wrote it out of my experience of proving God in every area of life. And we're happy to send that to you, invested into your life. But I want to say three things about, the, about faith. Faith is relational. Faith comes out of your relationship with God. You're not going to have much faith if you don't know God. In, in the Old Testament it says, the people that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. When you know God personally, when you spend time in his presence through prayer and the word, something happens. You get empowered by God. It comes out of relationship. Many of you that are watching this may be married. Many of you have parents. You know, to have relationship with either your husband or your wife or your parents, you have to spend time with them. You don't send them a text message. You don't leave a note for them. That's okay in an emergency, but to develop relationship, you have to spend time. And if you will take time to spend with God, your faith will start to grow. When you start to come and learn how to read and how to pray and how to meditate and how to obey the word of God, then something happens. There is a transformation that takes place on the inside of you. Because no longer is the world impacting you. The Holy Spirit in you is starting to change you so you can impact the world around you. You don't have to be affected by those things. But we have to be careful of what we watch, what we listen to, what we give our thoughts to, where we get involved in. Be very careful because those things can rob you of your faith. But if you spend time with God, then your faith will start to grow. So faith comes out of relationship, knowing God personally. And also, another way to make your faith grow is get around people of faith. Don't be around negative people. There are so many Christians that are so negative, they need deliverance from the spirit of negativity. Years ago I went to another nation to minister, and I, I was sent there. I didn't know anything about that nation. And when I got there, the first thing I noticed was how negative the Christians were. In fact, I stood up in the church and said, are you really born again? Because you're so negative. You know, Jesus lives in me. And the greater one is living in me than he that's in the world. Then why should I be negative? But unless I soak myself in God's word and know who I am in Jesus, then things are not going to work. The next thing I want us to know is faith is factual. It's based on knowing what God has said. Do you know what God has said about you? Did you know that in the New Testament, in, in the, the epistles, you know, Jesus come, we've got him in the Gospels, and we see how Jesus lived and worked and have did amazing things. But he said this. He said, whoever believes in him could do the same things that he did and even greater things because he's going to the Father. In the book of Acts, we see that happening. But then through, from Romans right through to, right up to the book of Revelation, all these letters to the individuals and churches, in there is over a hundred references to who we are in Jesus Christ, or who Jesus Christ is in us. Do you really know who you are in Jesus? Because when you know who you are, you can do the things God called you to do. So faith is based on facts. That's why I keep telling us we need to read the Word of God. We need to know who we are. He says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God. So did you know that? That once you got born again, you've become a new creation. You're no longer under the mastery of sin and Satan, but you're now under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It tells us in Colossians that we have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. One of the problems we have around the world today is called immigration. And the biggest problem with immigration, one of the biggest problems with immigration is when people come from another nation. They want to keep their language, they want to keep their food, they want to keep their culture. They don't want to change. They just want the benefits of living in another nation. But they don't want to change and let go of the way of life from their old nation. Very strange, isn't it? People who long to get into Europe from around the world. And yet all they do is set up their little colony of people from their own nation. They don't want to change and adapt and become part of the new nation. And many Christians are like that. They get born again. They come into the church. But they want, don't want to leave the world behind. Faith is based on what you know. And we need to know what God says about you and what he requires of you. Let's see what else faith has to say. Faith is functional. That means it's living and acting on what God says. And you know, when we start to see that, uh, it's amazing how it changes our life. 
Uh, if you want, uh, if you just would like an example, something you could go home and put into practice, just take one chapter in the book of Matthew, and that will revolutionise your life. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about five things. And if you will take what Jesus says, it'd be amazing. First of all, he talks about giving. A lot of people don't like it when we talk about giving, but Jesus talks about giving. I know there's been a lot of teaching about where people say, oh, if you give this, you will get that, and, you know, give and believe God for big, big amounts back. That's not what Jesus teaches. But Jesus teaches how to give. And he says, when you give, you have to do it. You do it not as a show. You don't tell other people. You're doing it unto God. And God who sees what you do will reward you. If some of you listening, watching this, would learn to give to God willingly, generously and joyfully. Just read 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and chapters 9. And when you learn to give to God properly, you'll find the blessing of God coming into your life. Not just so you can keep it, but so you can bless even more people. I have to tell you, for 35 years, I've been proving what I'm talking about, about trusting God where finance is concerned. And we've seen God do so many miracles, so many miracles from, you know, the smallest miracle that ever happened for me, but it's one I've never forgotten, and I always get excited telling about it. One Sunday, I was getting ready to go to the church service, and I realised I didn't have any money. I had no money whatsoever to put in the offering. And so I prayed and asked, the Lord Jesus to give me some seed to sow, because that's what it says in 2 Corinthians 9. And when I got to church meeting, the man at the door was welcoming people, and he had his little boy with him, a nine-year-old son. And I talked to this man, and like most adults, we talked to the adults and we ignore the children. And I just went to walk past the go in, and he said, excuse me, Pete, my son would like to talk to you. And his son gave me a little envelope and said, Pete, God told me to give you this. And in this little envelope, there was a text, which he copied from his brother who had just been baptised, one of the texts he had at his baptism. He gave me a text, and in there was ten pence. Hey, I had my offering. I've never forgotten that God answered a need and provided a seed. I want to tell you, when you learn to trust God, it's amazing what he will do. We've seen God supply and take us around the world. We've fed the hungry. We've clothed the naked. We've minister God's word free of charge in nations where they couldn't afford us. We have seen God do it. You need to learn how to give because giving is an act of faith. Jesus says when you give, then he promises Father will reward you. Next he goes on in chapter 6 he talks about prayer. When you pray. Not if you pray, when you pray. And he tells you, ha, he tells us two things not to do. Don't be like the heathens and don't be like the hypocrites. Don't make a show of it so people look at you. But go and sit quietly in your room and pray and ask your father who, you, who is in secret and he will reward you. Does it work? I have to tell you it does. Some years ago I was wanted to go to a conference and I kept praying about it. Should I go? Shouldn't I go? And it was going to cost a lot of money. It was the other end of this nation. I had to pay a train fare. I had to get a pay for the hotel. I had to pay for the conference fee. And I knew there would be an offering. So I needed quite a lot of money. I could just about squeeze it, but I thought, why don't I pray and ask God if he wants me to go? So I prayed, said, Father, please provide this money if you want me to go to a conference. And through a whole series of events, people that I've met some years ago, all of a sudden got in touch with me, and they sent me a gift, exactly what I needed for the conference. I hadn't even told my wife I was praying about the money, but God did it. I want to tell you, when you learn to pray, it's amazing what God will do for you. And then... It's also knowing, uh, acting on it. So Jesus talks about when we give, when we pray, and he shows us how to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. But there's many other prayers in Scripture, you know, like in Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul is praying, praying for the church. And you can take those prayers and you can pray them for yourself. In Ephesians 1 verses uh, 15 to uh, 23, and in chapter 3 verses 16 to 21, you can take those prayers and you can pray them over your life. Put your name in there and start to pray them for yourself. They will transform you because you're learning to pray according to the will of God. Well, I'll talk a bit more about prayer in our next section. But then Jesus talks on and goes on to talk about fasting. He said, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. He said, when you fast. Again, he tells us how not to fast and how to fast. 
And I want to tell you, when you learn to fast properly, it adds power to your prayer. It somehow releases something. We see that in the Bible. When Daniel was praying and fasting, how that God released an answer. He was praying and fasting, but the answer came. And it was amazing what God revealed to him. So fasting is also important. And then Jesus goes on to talk in that chapter about where your treasure is. He said, don't, don't be working for treasure on earth. Go for heavenly treasure. Stuff on earth gets ripped off and gets stolen. We see today that so many people are saving for their future, only to find that people have ripped them off with different savings schemes or different pension schemes, and they're losing thousands and thousands of pounds. It's not wrong to save for the future, but don't put your confidence in that. Have your confidence in God. Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven. And if you have a, an eye towards heaven, then something's going to happen here on earth. God will bless you. And then lastly, would you believe it, in chapter 6 of Matthew, he comes to the most strange subject. Five times he tells us, do not worry. Wow. Whew. Do Christians worry? I don't think, here we are, this is the month of August, I don't think there's a Christian here in this nation of England that hasn't worried at some time between January and now in August. Worry seems so natural because it's fed to us by the news media. They're telling us this is going wrong, that will go wrong, this won't work, that's happened. And we can listen to it all and we can start to worry. But Jesus tells us about not to worry about basic things. You know, Jesus tells us, do not worry about what you're going to eat. Do not worry about what you're going to drink. Do not worry about the clothes you will wear. Now when I see some people in their clothes, I wish they would take a bit more concern. But you know, basically Jesus said, don't run after these things. He said, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So he tells us, he said, look, just look at, just look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap and yet they feed. He says, look at the flowers of the field. They, they are, they're much more beautiful than often our best clothes. And then he says, you know, by worrying, you can't add an hour to your life. In fact, if you're a person that's worried, you're probably going to shorten your life. Because worry is a killer. But Jesus says, four to five times, do not worry. But once he says, do not worry, saying, when you worry, sooner or later it will come out of your mouth. And you need to learn to believe God. To believe what God says. Faith doesn't deny circumstances, but faith believes God's word over the circumstances. And so as we learn to trust in God, we see things happen and come in a powerful way. So just in that chapter, Jesus is telling us not to worry. And you know, it's amazing, as I've told you, over 30 years now we've had to trust God and we've seen God provide amazing things for us. Yes, the small things. Yes, the big things. You know, God is so amazing. You know, God's got a sense of humour. I, I never get amazed, I never stop being amazed at God's sense of humour. When I was in business, I used to have money for anything I wanted. Money in the bank, money in my pocket, we had money. And then God called me out of business and the money, God let it go down so I learned to trust Him. And I was moaning one day to God saying, God, it's not fair. When I was in business, I could go out and I could go to the butchers and I could buy a lamb or half a pig, I just go buy the meat, put it in the freezer, and now I can hardly buy a pork chop. And one day I've been preaching, we was planting a church in a, in a town, and we were just a small group, and we had these new people that joined, come, started coming to the church, and one Sunday I've been preaching, and at the end, this new couple came to me and said, please can we talk to you? So I thought, wow, at last, they want to get born again, or they want to be baptised, they want to become part of the church. I was really excited. And then they asked me this simple question. <laughs> do you have a big freezer at home? I said, pardon? I <laughs> said, do you have a big freezer at home? I said, yeah. They said, oh, he said, we are keeping some sheep in, in, in another town, in a field. We have a, uh, some sheep there, and we're going to kill some, and we wanted if you like half a lamb. I said, oh, thank you so much. That would be wonderful. And then, just as they were stepping away from me, another couple came. And this couple, uh, the wife was part of the church, the husband hadn't yet got born again, but he used to come and collect his wife, or come down, have a cup of tea, and then take her home. And they were standing there and said, oh, can we talk to you, Pete? I said, yeah, of course you can. So I thought, I wonder what it is, and he had a carrier bag with him. They said, we were, we were tidying up at home, and we were clearing out this cupboard, and we found these brand new 
woolly jumpers. And we thought, wow, they look really good on Pete. Would you like them? And I said, oh, thank you. So they gave me the jumpers. And just about a day later, it dawned on me. I was complaining to God I couldn't buy lamb. So God, God turned up and he gave me not just the meat, but gave me the wool off the back. I want to tell you, God can do anything if you learn to do things God's way. And so when Jesus gave us the clue to overcome worry, you can't tell yourself, stop worrying. Because if you say that, you just worry all the more. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need will be added to you. And I want to encourage you, just start to go through God's word. Matthew chapter 6 will transform your life if you will do it. And you know, Jesus, Matthew 6 is the middle part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And let's read what Jesus said at the end of Matthew 7. When he's finishing his preaching. You know, what is amazing was that Jesus started off in Matthew 5 teaching his disciples. He called his disciples to him and they sat down and he taught them. But by the end of Matthew 7, when he's teaching his disciples, a crowd had assembled. People heard Jesus teaching the whole crowd was there. And then Jesus says this in Matthew 7 verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man. The rain came down, the streams rose, so like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And then it says this, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Friends, it's amazing what Jesus had to say to people. And as we learn to put his word into practice, we're building a solid foundation in our lives, and out of it something strong will come. So I want to just recap with you. We need to build ourselves up in our faith. And by doing that we have to realise that faith comes from knowing Jesus. It's out of our relationship with him. So faith is relational, knowing God personally. Faith is factual, knowing what God has said. And faith is functional, living and acting on what God has said. And as we obey the word of God, so our faith will grow and we will become strong and be able to help other people. God bless you and look forward to talking to you in the next session.